Hello, and welcome back to my channel. So, I know it's been a couple weeks since my last video. Uh, unfortunately, we had some stuff at home to take care of that kind of got in the way. And I know this video is also probably not going to be uploaded on my typical Tuesday. So I know that June is typically considered Pride Month. Uh, it's kind of what inspired doing my Drag King video. But even though it's July, I still wanted to talk about bisexuality. It's something really important to me since I identify as bisexual. I still wanted to make a video and talk about by erasure or by phobia and look at the history of bisexuals. And with that, I do have a couple disclaimers. The history of any LGBT community is a little difficult to trace or find, especially since any communities that were open-minded with that didn't really keep records. And like I stated in my Drag King video, history is written by the winners. Most of us in the community have not been the winners. And if it was hard enough trying to find information and history on Drag Kings, bisexuality was a little easier, but there is a lot of overlap with other aspects of the LGBT community. And I really wanted to focus on just the bisexual part. So that being said, I am mostly focusing on bisexuality and biphobia and the history of bisexuals. We're just talking about the bi's here. I really just kind of want to bring more awareness to the community because as someone who identifies as bisexual, I always feel excluded from the community. So for this video, I've sort of broken it down into three main-ish parts. So for the beginning, I just want to talk about the actual definition of what bisexuality is, what biphobia is, and possible reasons behind biphobia, and what bi erasure is. And then I'm going to follow that up with the history that I could find. So if it seems like I didn't pay a particular subject enough attention, it's because I felt it was leaning more towards uh, other aspects of the community and would have uh, taken away the focus from the bisexual community, which is the main focus of this video. And then at the end, I want to share some personal thoughts and experiences from myself and similar paraphrased stories from fellow bisexual friends and some thoughts and feelings as well about the community, about what it's like to be bisexual. So please keep that in mind. And while the history, I've researched as much as I can, and all the links for all the websites that I use will be in the description, like my Drag King video. My thoughts and opinions are not researched and they're subjective. So let's start with the definition of bisexuality. Uh, the definition of a bisexual person, according to dictionary.com, is someone who is sexually attracted, not exclusively to people of one particular gender, or attracted to both men and women. Also interestingly enough, the definition of bisexual also applies to uh, plants and botany. So uh, botanists use the term bisexual to describe plants that have both male and female reproductive organs, basically a hermaphroditic plant. Bear with me, it does come up later. Uh, the definition of bisexuality according to bi.org is uh, bisexuality is a broad and inclusive term that describes both physical and romantic attraction or sexual behavior that is not limited to one sex. So, as you can see, definitions are relatively similar. A bisexual person is just someone who is attracted to both male and female in both physical and romantic ways. Wikipedia defines bi erasure as a tendency to ignore, remove, falsify, or re-explain evidence of bisexuality in history, academia, or news media. 
Uh, it also includes uh, the assertion that bisexuality is just a phase and implies that the bisexual person in question will either choose to be straight or gay. Building upon that, there's a scholar named Kenji Yoshino, and he is a legal scholar and Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law at New York University School of Law. And he wrote a paper, which I do have linked in the description. It says that there are three main investments for both the hetero and homosexual communities that motivate uh, by erasure from both communities. So the first investment that he writes about is the sexual orientation stabilization. And this motivation uh, reinforces the belief that bisexuals are just undecided and are either fundamentally heterosexual or homosexual. That also sort of bleeds into the next one, which is maintaining the importance of gender. Uh, it's seen as erotically essential to both hetero and homosexuals So the third final investment that Kenji Yoshino writes about in his paper is monogamy and that a pair or a bond is preferred in mainstream culture, uh, both in hetero and homosexual relationships. Therefore bisexuals are assumed to be intrinsically non-monogamous. And building upon that, um, Juana Maria Rodriguez adds in volume 21 number one to two of the Lambda Nordica in a article that she wrote named Queering Femininity by uh, positing that bisexuality breaks down traditional understanding of sexuality and the gender binary. She also writes that bisexual women in particular have had their sexuality labeled as a political cop-out and can be viewed as anti-feminist. So I said that bi erasure is a byproduct of biphobia. So what is biphobia? The definition is basically similar to homophobia and transphobia, and that is an aversion to bisexuality and bisexual individuals. So as a result, bisexual people bear a social stigma that they're unfaithful in relationships, leading back to Kenji's investment of monogamy and that bisexual people are intrinsically non-monogamous, uh, that they lead a double life, trying to pick a side, and that they can spread diseases like the HIV AIDS pandemic of the 70s and 80s. They're also characterized as slutty, easy, dishonest, indiscriminate, and liars. Now, before we get into the history, I also want to lightly touch upon the concept of two-spirit in First Nations culture. Now, with the recent events in Canada, I realize as a white person this is a sensitive topic, but I felt that it deserved a chance to be featured in this video. Any websites that I used are all linked in the description as sort of what Two-Spirit is and how it also sort of ties into LGBT and bisexual history. The term Two-Spirit comes from Ojibwe words, I'm going to put them right here because I don't want to butcher their pronunciation, and it was first coined in 1990 as a way for First Nations people to distance themselves from non-First Nations people and the word gay. These people are viewed as gifted because they carry with them the spirit of both male and female, and sometimes are referred to as a third gender. Nowadays, uh, First Nations people use the term two-spirit to describe anyone who is uh, gay, bisexual, transgendered, or other gendered. It's a very sensitive subject in Canada right now, and if you are interested in learning more about um, First Nations LGBT history and the term Two-Spirit, I highly recommend you do your own research 
and I will have links to that in the description box below. So for this section of the video we're going to try and look at the history of bisexual people and bisexuality as a whole. Now before I begin I really want to point out that trying to do research on LGBT history is rather difficult as it is and a lot of the history that I am able to find focuses more on men. Like I mentioned in my Drag King video, it is really hard to try and find LGBT history in general and even harder when you try and look at the women. So it's not that I didn't want to include bisexual women history, it's just that it's a little more difficult to find than I would like. It's based off of who documented it. So in this case, the earliest records that I guess historians have been able to find date back to ancient Greece and Rome. Now, obviously what occurs in history isn't going to float today. In ancient Greece, men were actually encouraged to enter relationships with older men, to sort of learn from them and see the older man as a mentor to guide them into adulthood. Of course, eventually when the young man did reach adulthood and did go on to marry a woman, presumably. It wasn't expected that the mentor relationship with the older male would continue, but there are cases where that did happen. Entering a relationship in more of a mentor sense means a lot different to us than it does, say, entering a romantic or sexual relationship with someone of the same sex. But I guess that was the logic and the reasoning behind it is you enter this relationship for experience and wisdom. And maybe something else, who knows. Uh, in Homer's Iliad, it's implied that Achilles has both male and female lovers. I personally have not read Homer's Iliad, um, but I can see that being the case. Uh, supposedly, Alexander the Great had both male and female lovers, but as a conqueror who gets to write history, take that as you will. Um, ancient Japan, uh, where those relationships also occurred, it was under a similar uh, circumstance in which it, the relationship did have to be between a younger man and an older man. And again, it was all sort of under the guise of a mentorship to learn and gain experience from your mentor, rather than it actually being romantically or sexually driven. But, moving from the Mediterranean over to China, uh, documents there say the Han Dynasty supposedly had ten emperors that were openly bisexual, and had their male favorite uh, documented in both the records of the Grand Historian, or Shiji, and the Book of Han, or Hanju, uh, which is I guess where this information comes from. Now again, we're looking at male, male relationships. During this time in the Han Dynasty, there was Emperor Ai, uh, was having a nap with one of his young male lovers and had to get up to obviously take care of something. And instead of waking his lover, he chose to cut the sleeve of his robe instead. This sort of translating into now the story of the cut sleeve. It was also used as a slang term to describe the love between two people. Now, also in this period, again, most of the history that we have is based around men, but apparently also in the Han Dynasty there was another colloquialism similar to cutting the sleeve, and that was eating the peach, possibly a slang term for two women engaging in oral sex. Uh, apparently there are ancient tombs in Egypt where uh, two male mummies were found in, uh, entwined together. So steering away from uh, ancient times, in 1553, King Henry VIII uh, passed the sodomy law in England. Prior to this, uh, Christianity was taking a hard stance against uh, homosexuality therefore affecting bisexual men as well. Um, like the name implies, sodomy basically made certain activities illegal, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Religion did play a huge influence at this time. So after 1553 we're gonna make a huge jump and again most of the history that I can find now is gonna be sort of European North American centered. 
1886, a German psychologist, this guy, published Psychopathia Sexualis, but it translates roughly into English as um, sexual psychopathy, uh, a clinic forensic study. It was written as a clinical reference for psychologists, physicians, and judges. Uh, it was one of the first books about sexual practices and that studied specifically homosexuality and bisexuality, because up until that point, who cared? Now remember this was written in German. Then in 1892, Charles G. Chaddick translated Psychopathia Sexualis into English. Uh, giving the English language words like sadist, masochist, homosexuality, bisexuality, necrophilia, and analingus. Uh, prior to this translation, uh, bisexuality was used to describe hermaphroditic plants. Now it has two meanings. So, yeah, at the, the late 1800s was definitely a interesting time for psychiatry and medicine and uh, unfortunately we are still undoing some of the issues that came up then so hey at least the book was uh, you know written about bisexuality and homosexuality however it viewed it as a mental illness and now we're moving into the late 1940s shortly after World War II so in 1948 Alfred Kinsey published uh, a report the Kinsey reports using a scale he designed in order to demonstrate that sexuality does not fit into two strict categories. Instead, it is more fluid. There's a scale. However, Kinsey disliked using the term bisexual to describe people who have sexual activity with both men and women and would only use the term in its original botany definition. And so I don't, it, it, I couldn't find any records of what words he did use. I imagine they were pretty boring. And again, we still obviously see cases of homosexuality being treated as a mental illness, even if um, Alfred Kinsey's scale did reflect that some people do have interests across the gender spectrum. However, a lot of his reports were sort of disregarded in the medical community because a lot of the interviews that he did were with certain individuals that the medical field didn't really deem uh, savory or trustworthy or really worth anything because the only people who were willing to talk about their sexuality at the time and participate in these um, reports were prison inmates, prostitutes, you know, people's on the fringes of society that no one really cared about. I still think, however, the findings are really interesting, and I do have them in the link below if you'd like to check them out. Now, we're gonna start moving into the late 60s, and obviously this is where a lot of LGBT history that affects us nowadays really starts coming into play. So, um, trying not to speed through it, but we're gonna start in 1967. And again, this is where I'm really trying to focus on bisexual history. And trust me, there is a lot of overlap with like the gay and lesbian history and transgender history. But again, we're just trying to focus on the bisexual history. On April 19th, uh, 1967, Stephen Donaldson, aka Donnie the Punk, formed the first gay rights activist group at Columbia University. And this was a really big deal. Stephen Donaldson isn't even his real name. He had uh, a reputation, and in order not to ruin his father's reputation, whom he shared the same name, he actually had to enter Columbia University using the pseudonym Stephen Donaldson. So in order to make this a chartered organization within Columbia University, they had to have a certain amount of members. But obviously there was a huge stigma and fear against uh, being an open member of this chartered group. So Stephen had found sort of a loophole in saying that people could uh, support this group without being an official member, but have their um, support still count. There's a certain word for it. I will put it up here when I find it during editing. And through that loophole, then he was able to get enough members to have his group 
registered and recognized as a chartered group within Columbia University without revealing the names and faces of the actual members who didn't want to be named as it were. And Columbia University was very afraid of this getting publicity and sort of ruining the school's reputation and even though he promised that it wouldn't, it did anyway. So by... and with the publicity that they ended up getting, this led to the formation of similar groups in other universities and colleges. And by 1971, there were 150 certified chartered organizations within university and colleges throughout uh, the United States of America. So that's awesome. However, in uh, prior to joining the Navy, Donaldson had actually fallen in love with a woman and began to identify as bisexual and actually left the movement in 1970 due to his growing discomfort with biphobia within uh, the gay community. So then, after leaving the Navy on an honorable discharge for dalliances with men, Stephen attended the annual Friends Quaker General Conference in Ithaca, New York in 1972, where he ended up holding an impromptu workshop on bisexuality. And then in 1987, Stephen worked with Brenda Howard to found the New York Area Bisexual Network. And this is um, definitely a moment where I'm going to take a pause and sort of branch off a little bit because learning about Brenda Howard was amazing and I really want to give a moment to talk about her because, <laughs> I mean, damn, the woman was inspiring and I am ashamed that I didn't learn about her until now. Uh, Brenda Howard was a militant activist in her time. She participated in organized protests against the Vietnam War and she is credited with coordinating the first Pride March in 1970 and is known as the Mother of Pride. Together with Donnie the Punk and L. Craig Schoonmaker, they're actually uh, credited with basically using the word pride to describe the LGBT festivities that started popping up at this time, and so Brenda Howard's actually known as the Mother of Pride, but that's not all. <laughs> she was also an active member of BIPAC, or the Bisexual Political Action Committee, which was founded in 1989 and was dedicated to confronting and eradicating biphobia and bi erasure. So now we're just, so yeah, so we're gonna pause there. So not only did New York Area Bisexual Network get founded in 1987, but also during the 80s we were having the issue of the AIDS epidemic. Bisexuals were actually often blamed for the spreading of AIDS to their partners. In fact, there's actually a Newsweek issue that was released in 1987 that portrayed bisexual men as the pariah of the epidemic. Because, obviously, as we know as at the time, originally AIDS was only believed to be a disease that gay men contracted, and then suddenly they were finding it in other communities and other genders as well, and so bisexual people came under heavy fire for that. Because we basically blamed for, you know, bringing it to the mainstream, I guess. <sighs> so during this time, BIPAC is formed by Brenda Howard, and in 1993, due to BIPAC's nationwide lobbying, bisexuals were actually included on the platform in the 1993 March on Washington for Lesbian gay, bi, equal rights. And this was a really big deal. <laughs> Over a thousand people marched in that contingent alone, just in New York. And in 1998, the bisexual flag was designed by Michael Page. And he drew inspiration from the bi angles designed by Liz Nania uh, when she was helping organize the bisexual contingent for the March on Washington back in 1993. So 1998, Michael Page designs this flag. Now, the pink and blue stripes representing the male and female genders, and the purple in the middle representing the attraction to both. Then, in 1999, Wendy Curie, Michael Page, and Gigi Raven Wilbur created Celebrate Bisexual Day also known as Bi Visibility Day, and it continues to be celebrated every day on September 23rd. So 
obviously there's a lot of gaps in history, right? And a lot of the things that I said are mainly focused around European and North American history and values and documentation. I think that does say a lot about just LGBT in a sense as well. So that sort of concludes the history section. Obviously I know there's a lot of gaps missing. So now we've entered the last portion of the video where I want to share some of my personal thoughts and some of my opinions. Now, as a bisexual person, I do confess to not being an active member in any LGBT community because I just don't feel included. After we've sort of looked at the history of bisexual people in many different communities and cultures throughout history, it's kind of easy to see why. Bisexuals not only face discrimination in normative hetero culture, but also within the community itself. Anytime I've ever really told someone that I am bisexual, they look at my husband and go, are you sure? Even if they don't say it, you can see it, because I'm married to a man, the love of my life. But that doesn't change the fact that I'm also attracted to women, you know, sexually and intellectually and romantically. Does this mean I'm going to cheat on my husband with a woman? Absolutely not. Your sexuality has nothing to do with how you want to be in a relationship with a person and how that relationship dynamic works between you and possibly multiple partners no matter what you identify as. Similar to when I was doing research on my Drag King video, I was also really disappointed that a lot of the history that I could find on bisexual people and just the history of bisexuals in general was, again, male-focused which is why it was sometimes difficult to sort of differentiate and separate between gay history and bisexual history, because again, it focuses a lot on the men. And again, that's not to deter the importance of gay history and the achievements and hardships that the gay community has faced. It just sort of muddles the water when you're just trying to find information on bisexual history. And I think it's also disappointing when it comes to like film and television as well. So I do want to address one of the bigger elephants in the room and start with the biographical film of Freddie Mercury, Bohemian Rhapsody. I will confess before I start that I have not seen the movie and this is why. Fellow bisexual friends that had seen the movie and the reviews that I have read stated that the film basically performed by phobia and by erasure on Freddie Mercury's life. They also negatively portrayed the LGBT community in seeing that it was Freddie's introduction to the world of rock and roll and fame that pushed him towards homosexuality, which is not true. He was also not homosexual. He was a bisexual. Yes, he had relationships with men, but he also had relationships with women. I believe that that is fairly common knowledge within the LGBT community since Freddie Mercury is such an icon. And so to know that a film was made about his life and that part was blatantly removed. And it's disappointing. And it's contributed to the fact that I now have no desire to see the movie and I don't really plan on seeing the movie. Uh, another example that I think about often is Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the character Willow. For the first three seasons, she does show an interest in men. She has a big crush on Xander and dates Seth Green's character. And then she meets Tara and then identifies as a lesbian, completely erasing the fact that she was previously interested in men. I did look into this and supposedly the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Joss Whedon, said it was controversial enough at the time to have an openly lesbian character on a TV show, but to then actually have her identify as bisexual, he stated that at the time, media just wasn't ready for it. Which I typically have a lot of respect for Joss Whedon, I like a lot of his work, and I like a lot of the characters that he creates, but I do feel like that's a bit of a cop-out, especially as someone who identifies as bisexual and really liked Willow. Willow was one of my favorite characters and it was just really a missed opportunity and I wish it had been treated differently. It's something I feel that we see a lot in film and television 
in that characters are still one or the other. They're either straight or they're not. Even if, you know, they seem to have an interest in both, they do eventually pick a side. Uh, which is disappointing. I would be great to see a character that does have romantic relationships with both genders and finds meaning with both genders and, you know, doesn't identify as straight or homosexual, but identifies as bi and saying that, yes, I do love both genders. Which also brings me to the idea of gender itself. Now, from a lot of the early research that I could find on bisexuals, one of the biggest controversies of being bisexual is that it completely flips the tables on what gender was and what sexuality was and the binary between in a world that really just wanted to be black and white, either be straight or be not. And now, with the introduction of a pansexual person, I feel that pansexual was there to supposedly fill a void that bisexuality wasn't filling. But if you look at the early examples of bisexuality and what it represented and what it did, bisexual and pansexual are almost identical. I know there are subtle differences, but I think that's because in order to, I guess, contain the definition of bisexuality, it was decided somewhere that a bisexual person just loves men or women. Hard stop. Whereas I think then pansexual was brought in to fill in the gaps to maybe include non-binaries and transgendered as well, which I personally feel was a little bit of a cop-out, especially now that a lot of bisexual people that I know say that they are bi slash pan. To me, they're almost the exact same thing. If you look at gender as a spectrum, like many people in the community do now, for me that means I love men, and, and so I'm not okay with the idea that it feels like someone changed my definition for me. So I remain identifying as a bisexual. It's also a little disappointing because I think also you find now that bisexual women are more accepted than bisexual men, which I think is unfair. I think bisexual men should be just as represented and accepted as bisexual women. But I also recognize that, similar to lesbian relationships, they are more commonly accepted because they are fetishized. The idea of two women together is attractive to a hetero man. I don't want the acceptance of my sexuality to be based on the fetish of someone else. I do not consider a bisexual man any less masculine if that's how he chooses to present himself because he also loves men. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I also know from other friends of mine when we've talked about identifying as bisexual, a lot of us have been told, oh, it's just a phase. It's just something, you'll get over it, you'll decide eventually what you like. And when we are dating someone, people are like, oh, so, you know, you're straight now, or oh, you're gay now. And it's like, no, this is just where I'm at right now with this person in this time, right? If it turns out you found your life partner and you do end up spending the rest of your life with them. It doesn't mean you picked a side, it just means you found your partner. It doesn't change that you can still be attracted to someone else. It also doesn't mean that you're going to cheat on that person either. There's so many cases of being misidentified because of the immediate acceptance or assumption when you're walking down the street with your partner, regardless of who they are. And it's disappointing. All of us have stories of it. We would love to be allies, but how can we be an ally to someone who won't be an ally for us? I just want more awareness spread about bisexuals, and I want the future generation of bisexual people to not be asked to pick a side or be told that it's just a phase. I just want them to be accepted for who they are, and I don't want their partner choices to be questioned. Who you love doesn't define who you are completely as one person. It's only one aspect of who you are, and it shouldn't be your defining trait. So with that, this concludes my video on bisexuality. I really hope you learned something. Please feel free to check out the links that I've left in the description box below. Don't be afraid to do your own research, and if I've done not enough, if I've missed something, please feel free to let me know. I learned a lot during this, and I know there's even more to still learn. See you guys all next time.